Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, Daryl Sutter said that March hockey is close and you got to be able to be comfortable in those tight games. And that's what we saw from the Flames this week. I'm Dan alongside Matt. And uh, Matt, very different week for the Flames, would you say? Yeah, it was a bit weird. The Flames got shut out twice the first two times this season. And yeah, they walked away with five points out of the eight. So despite getting shut out twice, eh, not too bad on the overall. Right after we recorded our last episode, uh, the Calgary Flames played the the Colorado Avalanche, and we weren't quite sure what to make of that one. Their second game of a back-to-back, and the Flames ended up losing that one 3 nothing to the Avalanche in Denver. I thought, all things considered, this was a good game for the Flames. You could tell the game, that the Flames were tired. You could tell they were on a back-to-back. They, I would not say they played their best game of the season, but I thought, overall, it was a pretty good Flames effort. What do you think? Yeah, they had plenty of chances. Pucks hopped on them. They just didn't ha- quite have enough finish. But if, considering it was their fifth game in seven days against a rested opponent, you know, in a on a road uh, game, like you know, there, there's only so much that you can stack against the team. And you know, Calgary, if they had gotten a bounce or two, could have easily won this game. And you know, uh, the bounces didn't go their way. Vladar, I thought, played rather well. Um, but, you know, sometimes you just have games like this. And, you know, it was kind of to be expected after the Flames beat Colorado last week. Um, so, you know, not altogether unsurprising. No, definitely not. And I think, you know, if we look at the score sheet for this one, the Flames led in most categories. They led in, sh- in uh, shots on goal, they led in uh, having less penalty minutes, more hits, more blocks, less giveaways. So I would say that this was really, uh, uh, you know, the Flames looked better on the score sheet, or let's say in the stats department, than they did on the final score sheet in this one. Yeah, and I don't like, think it, we honestly, can take like, it. Honestly, like if this was like a playoff series and like both teams were coming in at the same energy and fatigue level, the Flames win this game. Well, and I think that's an interesting thing to talk about, too. And I was talking about this on Twitter afterwards on our uh, Twitter account, at Fireside Podcast, saying, you know what? Yes, the Flames lost this one, but if we look ahead, you know, two, three months, it's going to be a best of seven. And, okay, so we lost one, but we've won one already against them. And what do we do the next time? And I think, like you said, they're a tired team. They played five and seven. You lost one, but they didn't get themselves blown out, despite what the final score says. No, and like that, it, this was literally a game where if a bounce or two had went our way, uh, the Flames skate away with two points in this one. It's just yeah, I it think didn't. you're, you're so, right on that. You know, and, and that's like with all of the other factors. If they had gotten lucky, some lucky bounces going their way, they still would have won. So, you know. All things considered, that was about as pinnacle of, of an effort as you could hope for, really. I agree, and that's the kind of effort that in the playoffs helps you wear down that opponent for the next one. Oh, for sure. Like, especially in a seven-game series, that's why it's imperative that Calgary is built the way that they are, because you just wear the heck out of your opponent. And, you know, uh, like, the, if a series is going six or seven, like, the other team's just going to be running out of gas, and you'll be winning that series. So, you know, it's a good thing, and hopefully that can carry on into May and June. Well, after that, the Calgary Flames had two days off, the 14th and 15th. They came back and played the Saldome the night of the 16th. Brad Treliving got bored during those two days and decided to make a trade because he was bored. We'll talk more about that trade later, but um, it was announced just an hour or so before the New Jersey game. The Calgary Flames acquired Kelly Yarncroke. All of us media people were scrambling to try and talk to Kelly, talk to the GM. Um, it made for an interesting night. But the Flames were back in the Dome against the Devils and ended up with a 6-3 win. Um Daryl said, I think, more most apt about this game that the Flames outscored their mistakes. Yeah, like this was not a great game by the Flames by any stretch. But uh, for the, next, the second time this season, they just murdered Nico Dawes. And, you know, uh, like there was nothing that the goalie could do. Uh, Calgary just lit him up 
and you know he's not an experienced goaltender it's his rookie season and you know it, it's a tall task for you know even a veteran goalie to face a team with as many weapons as Calgary has but you know getting a rookie in there you know it just it's not conducive to good things <laughs> And because they let up Nico Dawes, that made way for former Flames uh, prospect goalie John Gillies to take the net for the second half of the game. He played, uh, he came in, I think, midway through the third, and uh, Gillies played um, 29-46 in this game. Matt, now that we're seeing Gillies play at the pro level, and obviously, like you said, taking on a lot of weapons, does he look any better to you than he did when he was our AHL goaltender? Uh, a little. Um and I think that has to just do with lack of uh, developmental time due to injuries when he was a flame. And, like, if you you subtract, like, the three years that he effectively missed, like, you're talking about a 25-year-old goalie who's just coming into his own. And for how he played, he looked acceptable as an NHL goalie, whether he progresses beyond that to being like a late blooming starting goaltender or not or if he just is a journeyman backup or not uh it's all up to john gillies but you know i i am rooting for him because like he did everything that calgary asked of him and we left on good terms it's just you know lack of a roster spot really and I hope he gets a good opportunity in New Jersey or elsewhere, and hopefully he can eke out an NHL career. This game was a game where I think we saw some depth scoring more than usual, and I think that was really the story of this one to me. We saw Brett Ritchie get his first of the year. Uh, Dubé got an assist on that. We saw Dubé get his seventh of the year. We saw Milan Lucic get his tenth of the year. Like Matt, you and I have talked about some of the depth scoring issues for the Flames. It seemed like in this one... Even though the team wasn't doing well, it was those guys. I mean, yeah, Mangiapane got one and Goudreau got one, but it seemed like it was really the depth guys in this one that were putting in the work for the Flames. Yeah, and Calgary needs to have a little bit more balance throughout the lineup, which part of that is getting guys like Toffoli and uh, Yarncroke. Uh, but um, it... it, it will be interesting to see because like ever since uh the flames really got tyler to uh dylan dubé has had a little bit of a fire lit under his butt to get going because he realizes that his spot in the lineup is not guaranteed anymore and he has been playing a lot better since to has joined the team and frankly since uh yarn has he's stepped it up a little bit more even and we'll, you know what, we actually, while we're talking about Dubé in that role, we actually have a quote from Daryl Sutter after this game talking to media about just that. He's talking about where Yarncroak fits and how bringing another player onto this roster without losing one is just going to create more competition. Yeah, and that will be a huge boon for this team uh, when it comes time for the playoffs because if you're not playing well, there's somebody else champing at the bit to take it out on the opposition. When you bring in a player um, and nobody's going out, it's just one more spot less available every night. How can that help? It's competition. competition. It's competition, very clearly. It's a player, the guy that can play in your top nine, play anywhere in your top nine. It's competition. So we've, other than one line, we've moved guys around all year. It's because nobody's grabbed onto it enough, right? So it's more competition. It's not. It's not my. I'm up and jump over the boards. It's about performance. And to that end, you saw two or three guys jump up and prove that they maybe deserve a spot. Those guys I was talking about. Yeah. Well, you know, it's the depth, right? That's those those guys play roles in our team. They haven't had much ice time. Brett didn't know till five thirty he was playing tonight. So that's you need that. It's your top guys aren't on. Well, Matt, now that we know the the coach's thoughts on Yarn Croak, let's talk about him and how he made his debut for the Flames when we look at the next game of the week. I think probably the most surprising outcome of the week, the Calgary Flames had the Buffalo Sabres come visit and the Flames lost one nothing to the Sabres. When you looked at this week, this was, the I think, of all the games, the one that we wrote in pen that we were going to win, isn't it? I hate 
watching the Buffalo Sabres play the Calgary Flames. Every year, the games between these two teams, there's always one that is just so mind-numbingly bad and boring to watch that give me 10 Arizona and Nashville games any day of the week. Like, this game was the epitome of painful to watch. And I think this is, like, the fourth or fifth time that the Flames have played Buffalo and gone to overtime tied at zero in, like, the last decade. It is always painful to watch these two teams play each other. It's like they both I think this is the worst hockey we've seen other. in the Dome this season. Oh, I think this is the worst hockey we've seen in the Dome in, like, five or six seasons. <laughs> like, it was, like, everybody was trying to outbat each other. You know, and to the Flames' credit, you know, like, they did have a couple of chances where they were absolutely robbed by Dustin Tokarski. And, like, Yarn Karoka and uh, Tanev both should have had tap-in goals, but... You know, if not for the goalie just flying through midair, Superman style, to stop the puck. You know, like, there's only so much you can do when the guy makes a two save-of-the-year candidate saves in two periods. You know, I think when we look at this one, the only two players I think that probably deserve any positive credit are the two goaltenders. Yeah, and more so Tukarski. Uh, he He full marks on this one. He stole this game for Buffalo easily, and, you know, all, all the props to him. Really sloppy play, Flames playing this one. The Flames got overworked, or, or sorry, outworked. And interesting here, the Flames only took six shots in the first. Like, that's really unlike this Calgary team. I know. It's like when the Flames are getting worked Buffalo in the first period, that good it's, like, defense. it's like, um, what? You know, did we enter Bizarro World? Like, you know, it just, yeah. This really uh, came down to which Oil- goalie made are, the first mistake. Yeah. It, are the Oilers wearing the Flames jerseys tonight? Like, what's going on? <laughs> you know, and there was little that we could, there's little that we could attribute to this one besides, you know, we couldn't say they were tired. We couldn't say they'd played too much. Like, they had some rest this week. I think this was just, and, and Matt, maybe let's have this discussion. Um, do you think that in these two games and even some other games that we've seen so far in the last, let's say, two weeks, are we seeing the Flames starting to slip into their old pattern of sort of playing down to their opponents? A little bit. Um, how would you say their talent level, that like their just raw talent level, is overwhelming the other teams? Uh, but I would not say that the Flames have been playing their best hockey over the past pretty much since the Montreal game or the even the Van- the first Vancouver game at the end of last month like they've been kind of fighting it a bit and like just getting by like in the New Jersey game where they just outscored the opponents or um you know to a lesser extent the Vancouver game this week it, it's just it's not really acceptable but when you're basically one of the like four elite teams in the NHL, you're going to get points that you shouldn't have, and like the Buffalo game is a perfect example of that. Where like for how they played, they should not have got a point out of that. They shouldn't one have even at got all. the single, no. But you know they've been able to luck their way um, or skill their way into extra points just by outclassing their opponent and it's not really good habits to get into especially over the next couple of weeks where basically the flames are playing mostly bottom feeder teams right through the middle of april and you know like calgary could go on a run where like they're racking up points but just playing horrible hockey and that could come back to bite them if they don't remain sharp yeah, I just that's something you and I have talked about for a number of years is that this team, you know, historically has kind of played to their opponent and having a lot of lesser opponents coming up, I'm worried that we might be seeing some of that and that they might sort of take their eye off the prize because of that. Yeah, well, like, even if you look at uh, just the next two weeks, like, all six of the Flames' opponents are bad. Um, well, no, uh, this week and then... Uh, 
pardon me, just this week, the opponents are bad. And, you know, then we play four games against good teams, and then it's like another plethora of really bad teams. And, it, you know, it it's going to be very up and down for this team and like they have to find ways of remaining focused and like actually treating each opponent as if they frankly matter um on an equal level because like if, if you look at like san jose which is coming up on tuesday like just talent wise and like where each of the teams is at like calgary should walk all over them but you know san jose also has enough talent where if you don't respect them they'll beat you like five to one so you know it's they have to figure out how to you know not look so much at the standings and just you know treat every game as if it's a playoff game and as daryl sutter said this week as well to get used to playing tight games yeah oh for sure and you gotta figure like especially down the stretch like every team is fighting for their playoff lives um, like even teams that are like apparently like well out of it like San Jose like they're still trying their best to make a good showing of it and possibly get back in the race a little bit and go from there and so like you're going to be facing desperate teams for, and, for other teams these games are more important than they are for us yeah it's like uh, when Vancouver beat Calgary 7-1 it's like oh okay sure um good for you you know you guys need the points to get back in the playoff race but to us it's like oh a blip okay and just carry on <laughs> so we have we have one more uh quote from our coach here and it, this is a quote i thought it was maybe the best daryl quote of the year um if you remember good branson was out in the second period in this one and we were wondering where was he when the second started and it turned out they're trying to get him sewn up and daryl didn't think that they could uh get him sewn up fast enough daryl said he could sew up a, a horse faster than they got good branson sewn up let's listen eric good branson didn't start the second period because he pulled... tried to find a doctor sew him up to get him out of the stands get him guys sewing guys up to stitch do your knitting right I could have done in five minutes, sold horses and cows up ten minutes. So I should have. Took 33 minutes to get stitches. Need six defensemen for 65 minutes. Or maybe all night. So hopefully our whole organization is learning from that. that well, was, Matt, that kind of, yeah, that that kind of was, throws the, the medical staff under the bus, doesn't it? Yeah, that was like an amazing... Uh, just an amazing quote by Daryl. I was in the front row with the presser, and I couldn't help but laugh. Oh, yeah. Well, Daryl is a bit of a horses. <laughs> you know, but, you know, we're, star and, we're starting to get, like, Bob Hartley and Daryl Sutter put together this year. Bob always had those great one-liners, and we're getting more and more of those from Daryl this year. Yeah, well, you know, it, it's good to see. Uh, and you can tell that he is having a lot more fun when he's willing to riff on you know and like especially you know it's a good tactic as well for him to approach it like uh, that after a game like this instead of like all the questions being on oh what the heck did happen with that one nothing loss to buffalo you know instead you know make some funny and silly quotes and you know that's what everybody walks away from instead of I don't know if it made on, it I don't know if it made it to the internet broadcast, but after the uh, the New Jersey game, Daryl held up his bottle of Perrier water and wanted all of us media people to remember our green tomorrow. Like Daryl's never been our our say, you know fun times reminder guy before for St. Patty's Day. Yeah. So very different side of Daryl we're seeing. Yes. <laughs> um, and then the Flames played another back to back. They've had a lot of these this month where they're playing one game at home, one game on the road. It's their last back to back of that type this month. And they didn't go too far. They went over to Vancouver. Um, in this game, we saw Dan Vladar in net, and the Flames drastically changed up their lineup. I'll just quickly read through the lineup that we saw here because um, it's very different than what we have seen. Daryl Sutter kind of talking about wanting to see some changes and get some new guys playing, you know, differently. 
The first line was Johnny Goudreau, Elias Lindholm, and Tyler Toffoli. The second line was Dylan Dubé, Michael Backlund, and Matthew Kachuk. The third line was Blake Coleman, Kelly Yarncroke, and Andrew Mangiapane. And the fourth line was Milan Lucic, Sean Monahan, and Trevor Lewis. It's a very expensive fourth line. Defense didn't change too much. Hannafin, Anderson, Shillington, Tanev, and Zadorov, good brands. And that changed a little bit during the game, but not a whole lot. Um, but a very different look to the forward group. What do you think of this forward group, Matt? Well, you think this it's something we just perfect... see for this game, or is this something we can move forward with? Well, honestly, um, it all you know, like what you're going to get when you get Gaudreau with Kachuk and Lindholm, and you know Backlund, Coleman, and other. So you know it when it comes time for the playoffs, you you know you would like to have a little bit more of a thought process on, oh, what happens if you put. Uh, Dubé with Kachuk and Backlund. Can you make that a quality second line? Can Dubé step up and be that quality winger? And, you know, he looked like it last game, but, uh, you know, like over the next 20 games, like the Flames have such a huge lead in this division, eight points with two games in hand, that, frankly, they can mess around a bit and see how things are for like especially this upcoming week where the flames are frankly playing three weak teams and uh you know see how things shake out and if the things aren't working you go back to the tried and true but if things are working well then hey you've just increased the scoring throughout the lineup and you've made your team even that much more dangerous and you have fallback options as well so there's like literally zero downside at this point. And obviously these lines worked because the Calgary Flames put in a 5-2 win against Vancouver in Vancouver on this one, getting goals from Hannafin, Kachuk, Anderson, Lindholm, and Goudreau. Um, we saw Vladar in net. I thought another good showing for, for Vladar here. The only time the Canucks really came to life was the first four minutes of the second. Um, but I thought the Flames really bounced back in this one. Everybody looked good. I mean, uh, Yarn Croak got his first point as a flame. The Flames outplayed the Canucks all night. It was very and impressive, I think, especially coming off that Buffalo game. And, you know, last week on our show, I gave Rasmus Anderson a hard time and chirped him a bit for, you know, only having two goals. Like, what, what are you doing, man? Now he's added another one. So, you know, like, got to step up. <laughs> He must, he must have been listening to you on the treadmill and said, well, if Matt's not happy, i got to go get another one. Well, anything to get the team going. <laughs> the, the transit time from the Dome to the flight to the Vancouver rink is about long enough to have listened to last week's episode. So maybe he's doing his homework, Matt. Yep. Um, no, I don't think much else to say there. Good Flames win against, um, against our rivals in Vancouver, and I think a good rebound after last game that didn't go their way. Yeah. Well, and frankly, like, the 5-2 score could have easily been 8 or 9 or 10 if uh, the Flames had a little bit more puck luck. And, frankly, uh, Thatcher Demko kept them in it for quite a while. Like, his first period, like, he made a number of really good saves in addition to the Flames you know, missing a couple wide open nets and the like. I totally agree. But it was good to see, even with new look lines, the Flames did well. And I agree with what you said earlier. I think I would keep these lines at least going in the San Jose game. They look good. It gives you a different look. Let's try it once more. Yeah. With that week now in the book, the Flames are still in the first first spot in the Pacific Division. They're at 84 points now, still nine points down on Colorado, who has set, uh, 93 points. The Flames now 62 games in, 38 wins, 16 losses, eight overtime losses. Um, the next team below us in the Pacific, not who we would have expected going into the season, is L.A., then Edmonton. And weirdly enough, Vegas is below Edmonton. I know, and if you're basing it on point percentage, they're actually outside of a playoff spot right now, with Dallas taking the last wild card spot. So, yeah, bizarro times in the Pacific Division. Uh, like Calgary is the only team that I really expected to be roughly where they're at, and everybody else, it's kind of like um, this makes no sense. 
Well, Calgary was really trying to keep that number one spot, and they did so by getting, I think, their, their last big piece of business that we'll see done early before the trade deadline. As I mentioned earlier, um, it looked like Tree had two days off and decided to be productive. He made a big trade on Wednesday, bringing Kelly Yarncroke to the Flames from Seattle in exchange for the Flames' 2022 second-round pick. That's the one uh, that we got from Florida. Um, for the 2023 third round pick and the 2024 seventh round pick, which they had to give up in order to get Seattle to retain 50% of Yarn Croak's salary, so roughly $1 million. Matt, when you can acquire a player like Yarn Croak without giving up something off the roster, it's a pretty impressive trade to be able to pull off, isn't it? Yeah, especially when you're talking a player that's been pretty much like a 40, 50 point kind of player and is exceptionally good defensively and plays physically like I'm actually kind of mystified that it didn't cost more than that frankly and with him being so familiar with several of the players on the team with Lindholm and Markstrom uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the Flames kept him for a long time after this season Yeah, he's the first cousin of Elias Lindholm and good friend of Jacob Markstrom. They all grew up in the same city. And I think, like you said, I mean, as much as his current deal is only a one year, I can definitely see him wanting to re-sign here because he's got that connection with his friends. Well, and on top of that, like uh, I I think that Calgary would have probably been his number one destination on July 1st anyway. So, you know, it's one of those that why not pick him up now? have a nice playoff run uh, to entice him to re-sign for like another three or four seasons. When we brought him in, Daryl Sutter said this is a very well-rounded player, a guy who can play all three forward positions. He's a 30-year-old, 5'11". This year with Seattle, he's played 49 games, 12 goals, 14 assists for 26 total points. And if you look at his current trajectory, he's on pace for 38 points this season, which is, it was still his best NHL season to date if that happens. Um, You know, for a guy who's probably going to end up being in your, you know, second or third line, I think this is a really impressive signing. And yes, the Flames gave up a lot of futures, but, you know, you're getting a, a huge amount of depth for a playoff run. Well, on top of it, uh, the picks that the Flames gave up realistically are a late second, uh, which is more like a third-round pick, a third-round pick that's more like a fourth-round pick, and a seventh-round pick, which will probably be one of the last picks in the draft. So, like, yes, because of the number attached to it, but in practical senses, like, it wasn't as big a deal. When I saw or when I heard the GM, because I was in the press conference, saying that in order to get uh, Vegas to retain half the salary, it only costs a seventh, I thought, geez, we should never make another seventh-round pick. If that's all it takes to get salary retained, let's just get guys retained on every deal. Yeah. Like, that seemed very cheap for the salary retention. I guess there's only a million bucks, but... Yeah, and in practical terms, it was probably like $150,000, but... um, Yeah, no, and... With this trade, uh, you know, like if the Flames are able to re-sign him, um, it kind of does make Michael Backlund a little redundant in the lineup. So if you wanted to save some money there, you know, um, you could hypothetically keep Yarn Croc and trade Backlund at the draft or free agency time or whatever. And you could probably recoup most of, if not all of, the assets that we traded today. Or yeah, I don't, I don't see Backlund getting traded. I think they've got other fish to fry before they would move Backlund. I agree. It's just one of those. It it creates an option. Is more what I'm getting at. Kelly Yarncroak has worn number 19 for most of his NHL career, and since that's taken here in Calgary, he becomes the first Calgary Flame to wear number 91 for this team. Not many guys have worn numbers in the 90s. It's been him, it's been Nylander, and I think Camilleri, really the only three guys anyone can think yeah. of. Um, so, Matt, you were saying earlier why you thought it was weird for him to be wearing 91. Yeah, well, anytime you hear the number 91, the first name that jumps to my mind is Sergei Fedorov, just from being awesome with Detroit all those years. So, 
seeing 91 on the flames, it's like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. Oh, and then I forgot an important 93, Sam Bennett. Yeah. He's kind of dead to us now, so we don't remember him. But yeah, he also wore a number in the 90s. Yeah. You know, and you know, it's 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 funny because there were those years when we had Berkey here, who was very much like you see the Zolak. He goes, nobody over 30, and now we got 73 and 91. Like I don't know, I've always kind of liked having high hockey numbers. I think it's kind of fun. Yeah, it, it depends on the type of player. Like if it's some, you know, like fourth line guy throwing like a 97 out there, it's like, um, okay sure um but you know when it's a skill player or some such doing it, something different that's always a little bit more interesting up until this year i would kind of said you know what oliver shillington deserves a 58 because he was kind of the nobody on this team and now it makes me wonder if he might go for something different next year but we'll talk next year's numbers later yeah well matt uh Tis the night before a trade deadline, and all through the league, the GMs are working hard to improve their teams. It's like the night before Christmas, and it's currently Sunday night. We've got less than 24 hours till the deadline. The Flames made an interesting move today, putting Brad Richardson on waivers. By doing so, Richardson's making 800000 this year. Uh, the Flames will free up $1.5 million, million in total cap space. But technically, they can't use that space until noon tomorrow one hour before the deadline which means tree can sleep in but he's got to work quickly yeah um well at least they created a little bit more space i don't think that they're done um and frankly i think that there's a couple of spots where they could add a decent player or two up front are you surprised they didn't wave more guys like i would have thought they would have waved richardson richie and stone uh, no, because I think teams might pilfer, um, you know, because that, that's basically a, a free, like, 13th forward or 7th defenseman. You know, I, like, I, I'm i kind of expecting Richardson to get claimed tomorrow. So, and... For a guy who's got two Stanley Cup rings, I, I would agree with you. I think if I'm a team that's looking for some veteran help, I might bring him in even if I don't plan to play him, just to have him around your room. Yeah. So, you know, and I think that's the main reason why you only saw, like, Ruzitska get reassigned to Stockton and, like, none of the veteran guys get waived because basically they're gone, and uh, you know, in my head. And um, you need to have the in-case-of-emergency depth because the last thing you want to do is running into your, like, 17th and 18th forward. Yeah, and as I've said to you, too, I think this year, more importantly, is let some of those those other guys, those 17th, 18th forwards, play in Stockton because they're doing well um, and, you know, have enough depth up here. Yeah. I would not be surprised if Richardson gets gets claimed. Yeah. And, you know, if he does, then best of luck to him. He did very well in his time here for the role that he has and you know it, it'll be interesting to see if he gets claimed where or to and I'm sure that there are a number of playoff teams that wouldn't mind my guess would be Dallas if that any. seems reasonable um, before we talk about what we think the Flames might still do just some notes that have come out over the last couple of days um, Calgary Puck I believe it was Ryan Pike reported an interesting sort of um, wrinkle to things. A lot of people wanted the Flames to bring Giordano back. We talked last week about why that was a bad idea. But interesting note that uh, Pike found, there was a rule attached to the Seattle expansion process. The Kraken weren't allowed to trade a claimed player back to their original team with retained salary for a full calendar year, even with a third team being used as a broker. However, they were able to make trades back to the original team without retaining salary. So I think, you know, it, when you looked at the feasibility of bringing Giordano in, there would have had to be some retained salary. And that, what what was reported says, you know, it couldn't have been done even if they wanted to. And there's no way the Flames were going to realistically free up five and a quarter million dollars. Yeah, it's one of those things that, like, even though, like, neither one of us really were too gung-ho on the idea, you know, like, it, it clearly was not going to happen with that 
situation. And as we've seen players come off the board before trade deadline, uh, Pierre Lebrun noted that the Flames were heavily involved in negotiations with Anaheim for Hampus Lindholm and Montreal for Ben Sherratt before those defenders were traded this week. So obviously the Flames still looking for another defenseman. And Matt, I think that brings up the question, you know, with less than 24 hours left for the deadline, what do you think the Flames still have to do? Or what do you think will they will get done? Well, I I think that like for uh, like a bit of like a scramble deal to get something at the end of the day, I would not be surprised if the Flames didn't go out and get Zdeno Chara on like the last year of his contract um, from the Islanders because he's only making a million dollars, I think. So they could easily fit that in, um, and he'd be a decent number five six. Uh, beyond that, it, it's really hard because of the fact that uh, Calgary is in a weird spot where, uh, like, with the emergence of Shillington, it, you're kind of reticent to go and get someone that would displace him from the lineup because he is doing rather well, but he's also a bit risky to have as your number 3-4 guy when he's not used to playing in the playoffs. So, like, I can understand, like, why they were trying to get Ampus Lindholm. And, you know, like, frankly, I think that you have to be in on those talks regardless if you're, like, really, really wanting that trade or not just because of the, the caliber of the player involved. But So you uh, mentioned Zdeno it, Chara and him being a 5'6". Who do you move out of the lineup if he's in your 5'6"? Uh, probably Zadorov. So, yeah. Just because Zadorov takes too many penalties, that's the only Interesting. reason. Interesting. He's like our Sam Bennett of the blue line. Yeah, because like especially in the playoffs, like you do not need Zadorov uh, taking like two minutes here, two minutes there. You know, like a guy like Chara knows how to walk that line of being that physically aggressive bear of a player while keeping it legal, mostly. Yeah, I can see that, um, that idea. I don't think, though, that they're going to get a guy that we'd slot into the top six. Just looking at the assets available, I think that they really want to do whatever they can without moving a roster player and without moving a prospect for a rental. And looking at the assets available, I think you're going to end up getting a probably a number seven, a Dean Kukin type, just to fill that void as a, another NHL defenseman. Yeah, and that could be very well where it goes. So, and even um, then, I think it would cost. It, I think it'll just a fourth or a fifth. I mean, we've yeah, we've seen them be... deal fourths and fifths for you know depth defensemen in the past. Well, it's just like uh, Robert Haig getting traded to Florida today for a sixth round pick. You know, like any of those guys probably will get a sixth or a seventh. So it, it, you know, Calgary just has to. Wait if we look see. back at previous uh, deadline deals, Derek Forbort cost us a fourth. Eric Gustafson cost us a third. Um, Oscar Fantenberg cost us a fourth. Those are kind of the last sort of depth defenseman deals we made. I think, you know, fourth is a reasonable price to pay at this point um, for a depth defenseman. A guy that could be, like you said, if you need him to be six, or I guess if you need him to be seven, you could, or six, you could, but I think he'll primarily be number seven. Yeah, we'll see. Um, there are plenty of options available. Do you think, like, what what ammo does Tree still have, especially with us needing to wait till noon to clear the Richardson cap hit? Do you really think Tree's going to do much besides kind of that one player? I think he's kind of out of out of ammo and out of time at this point. Well, the only thing that I could see happening uh, is that you have to figure that. Uh, with how he's played this season that Sean Monaghan is likely not going to be back next season and if you're just looking at a strict buyout like that will save the team 4 million dollars on his cap hit if you can make a trade uh, between now and tomorrow that ships Monaghan out and you're retaining less than the 4 million or uh, the 2.3 million, I should say, uh, 
or you're getting assets in return while you know the cap savings are about the same i could see the flames deciding to move on from monahan which would also free up cap space to do but other who, things like if they wanted who to who wants to take on that salary right to now to go uh, well, I I think a lot of teams are looking at Sean Monahan, and then looking at Florida with Sam Bennett and going, hmm, maybe Calgary is misusing another center. Maybe, but do I need to take and that on now, or do I could... wait till the draft to take that on if I'm another team? Well, and that's where like some teams that are, you know, frankly bad, um, that are looking for any sort of lifeline, um, could potentially be interested in Monaghan um like a any of the well basically non-playoff teams in the Eastern Conference um even some of the ones that are in the West uh could look at Monaghan you know because he does only have one year left so it's not like it's a major risk for them like it, you know if you're a non-playoff team like say Columbus like they're basically screwed regardless. But again, then, if you're a Columbus, right? why and make that deal now where it'll probably cost you more? I, I don't think it would. And I think that's part of the point is that I think, like, the Flames would be like, here, we're willing to, you know, you're going to get a sweetheart deal. We just want to get his money off the books for next year. See, and, and I guess if it's for um, next year. <sighs> Is it better just have the NHL body for this year? And that's kind of what I'm thinking is I think you'd... Well, and th that's where, like, if you're going to do that, I think you have to partner it with going out and getting yet another player at the so deadline. So then let's, to... let's go down that road. What do you have left to get for a guy that you would need that much cap room for? Uh, we have draft picks for next year. We have our second round pick this year. Um, and... I don't foresee the Flames using any of their prospects because, frankly, I there's no need to. The guys, th I just feel like and if like you're, you're getting, looking at other if teams, you're, if you're using the second round pick to bring in a defenseman, which probably be what it would end up being, a high priced defenseman, I think you're probably overpaying for that guy tomorrow. Possibly, um, I think that like if you're trading Monahan out, I think you're wanting to go get another guy in the uh to fully yarn crook mold where like a solid middle six guy and you know just so that way like a guy like trevor lewis can be pushed down to the fourth line and be on the fourth line instead of with backland and Coleman. i'd be very surprised if a monahan deal gets done tomorrow that's about like other than like uh nibbling around the edges and adding like a depth player that's about the only play I could see legitimately happening tomorrow that could actually, and then, you know, precipitate like another sort of like a quasi three way trade, like the Toronto uh, trading Dermot to Vancouver and then Vancouver trading uh, Hamannick to um, Ottawa. You know, like a three way kind of situation there i mean monahan is so, still a serviceable nhler you know, he might not be your number one guy but he's a serviceable nhler for where he is in the lineup i think right now if you're the flames you just need to collect serviceable nhlers and i don't know that moving one out now is the right way to go no and again like this is only one of those situations whereas can you both save some of the money for next year while making the team better this year and like that would be literally the only reason why you make the trade is can you make this team better and solve some of the issues for next year and it like if you can actually meet both of those conditions then it makes no sense not to pull that but again realistically i don't see that kind of a thing happening at all and i think that like if the flames need to get rid of monahan's contract uh, in the offseason, the only way to realistically do that is to buy him out. I just realistically can't see a dance partner for Monaghan at this year's deadline. Yeah. I'm sure there's a few. Uh, a team like Buffalo would definitely be interested. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. If I was Buffalo, I might take a wait-and-see approach until the offseason on, on a deal like that. Yeah. I think that we'll see one more... 
depth piece, um, a better than Michael Stone piece added to our lineup, and I think that's about it. I think trees run out of ammo. I mean, you don't want to mortgage two years worth of drafts just for, you know, rental players. Um, I think that's probably all you've got is that sort of four or five pick for uh, another defenseman. I think that's all we'll see tree get done. Yeah. And, you know, the only way I could see them realistically trading like future draft picks and that kind of going down that rabbit hole would literally be if that player is under contract or is a restricted free agent um and yeah then you can justify it well hey this guy's already developed and we can slot him in for but like you said to do that we'd need to move some where, money out i mean i just think that's going to be a complicated set of maneuvers to make in you know let's call it 18 hours yeah, and if anybody could do it, it's Tree. So we'll see. It like, am I expecting anything grandiose? No, but if there is going to be anything exceptional, I think that would be about the avenue that you'd see it. If something like that's going to happen, that feels to me like, I mean, what you're talking about is a multi-step process. I think you'd almost need to see the report of a Monaghan deal by about 10 a.m., otherwise it's not happening. Yeah, and I think, frankly, you know, like, uh, if they're going to pull that kind of a thing, like, they, they're probably already at, like, the three-yard line in terms of the trade negotiations for that anyway. So, you know... It, it'll it'll be interesting to see. On the topic of trade deadline and Brad Richardson, we got a fan question this week. We uh, we've been asking uh, most weeks on Facebook and Twitter if anyone has any questions or topics they want us to go through. And this week, Andrew J D Jepson on Facebook um, gave us a question. He says, "What what does waving Richardson do for the team? And will it bring Rajichka up later, or is it to free cap space for assurance of a depth defenseman?" So I'll give my answer first to this, and you can chime in with. Your thoughts. I think that they're sending Richardson down and will probably keep him down there if they get another defenseman. I think, sadly, unless there's an injury, Rujicka stays in the AHL as well if they get somebody just because they don't have the money to bring Rujicka back up. I think, you know, we'll probably see Rujicka up here at some point, even if he's one of the, you know, AHL call ups late in the season or an emergency call up. But I think as a let's call it a full-time NHL this year. I think, sadly, Ruchichka and Richardson are both just going to be cap casualties if they bring in a defenseman. What do you think, Matt? Uh, pretty much. And plus, I think you're going to want to see Stockton get a little bit of reinforcements themselves. They just became the first team in the AHL to qualify for the postseason and are leading the entire AHL. So, you know, they're going to want to make an actual run for the Calder Cup. And, you know, if they Richardson and Rajitska can help that while the Flames are still doing their thing, that would be perfectly awesome in my book. Yeah, I know Rajitska got an apartment in Calgary. He was kind of told, you know, it's you can find a place to live. And I think this will be a blip. And I would, I'd be surprised if Rajitska is not back with the team next year or even – you know, maybe as a, a black ace in the playoffs, but I think for the rest of the regular season, he's going to be uh, a member of Stockton Heat just because of cap casualties. Yeah. I I, you might see him go up and down. Like, you know, if somebody gets hurt for a couple of days, you'll see him come up and go back down. But I think his full time role from here on out is going to be in Stockton. Yeah. Well, that brings us to our pre trade deadline episode. The next time I talk to you, Matt, will be the 27th, which is one week after trade deadline. So we'll see what shakes out and we'll get some time to reflect on it. But between now and then, the Flames play three games. It's not as busy a week as we've seen for the team, all at home. On Tuesday, the San Jose Sharks come. So that's one day after the deadline. Then they get a two day break. And then the Arizona Coyotes are here, 7 p.m. on Friday. And Saturday night, a Hockey Night in Canada tilt. Battle of Alberta, Calgary Flames, Edmonton Oilers in the Saddle Dome. Three games here. I'm going to give my predictions first this week. Um, neither of us did okay. well last week. You thought we'd win all four, and I thought we'd lose Colorado, win New Jersey, Buffalo, Vancouver. We ended up splitting the week with wins in New Jersey, Vancouver, losses in Colorado, Buffalo. Um, I've already locked in my picks. I think we're going to win San Jose and Arizona and lose to Edmonton. Um, I'm going to do a little bit different. I think we're going to lose to San Jose and beat Arizona and Edmonton. Why San Jose? I think that the Flames are being a little too casual lately. 
And Seattle, or San Jose is still a team that has enough firepower that they can beat the Flames. And I think that the Flames might just be a little too casual on the overall. So, See, yeah. I really debated this. I didn't... Uh, put it this way, I wouldn't be shocked if the Flames won all three at all. So it's just one of those... I don't think they're going to win both back-to-backs, and I was debating which one I thought they'd lose. We've seen the Flames struggle against Arizona more than they should the last couple years, so I thought maybe Arizona. But at the same time, Edmonton's had our number as well, and I think there's going to be more motivation for Edmonton to be ready for the Flames. Um, I I mean, I hate to say it, but I think Calgary's going to lose to the Oilers. But I know what you're saying about the mean casual, and I think if they do lose to San Jose... That's really the wake-up call, especially with two days after that for practice. And that's where Daryl would really start riding these guys. Well, and that's where I'm thinking that, like, if they did lose to San Jose, that Daryl would be like, yeah, go murder Arizona and Edmonton right now. Or, or do you get punished by, <laughs> you know, having you know, to go to the farm the next morning and helping with some of the spring cleanup instead of a bag skate. Or threatening to get somebody to sew up Good Branson. There you go. Hey, I got a cow for you guys to sew up. If you don't do it in less than 10 minutes, you, you get as much ice time as it takes you to sew up that cow. The guys yeah. who are fast get the most ice time. The guys who are slow, don't. We'll see you on this sheet in Arizona. So-and-so scratched. Why? Still sewing up cow. So three... That would be like the most perfect white reason to scratch That sounds like something you see from the Mighty Ducks if they went country, the movie. Yeah. Um, so we'll see what happens this week. <laughs> but of course, if anyone wants to get a yeah. hold of us with your thoughts on the deadline or this week, feel free to reach out. We'd love to hear from our fans, just like Andrew Jepson did this week. You can always get a hold of us on Twitter. We're at Fireside Podcast. On Facebook, we're facebook.com slash Fireside Chat. Uh, you can go to our website, and there's a place to leave a voice message right on the left side. You can go to our website at firesidechat.ca and send an email through the contact form. Or you can send us a text message. Our phone number is 403-768-2121. And let us know what you think, and we'd love to read those on the show next week. And just like we did last week, I will ask everyone who's listening, please leave us a review and a rating in whatever platform you're listening in. Spotify, uh, iTunes, Google Podcast, whatever. It helps us to to surface better for new Flames fans who are looking for something to listen to and to get more of the Sea of Red listening to our show. So we'd really appreciate if you could do that for us. Matt, I guess, uh, are you going to be watching all of Trade Trade Center tomorrow? A uh, fair bit uh, of it. Is, is this like a, Hoping a national holiday for you? Take the day off and sit on the couch with some popcorn? And... Uh take a nap early in the morning wake up around noon oh there's 17 trades what's going on (laughs) no uh yeah it'll be interesting to see like i'm kind of perplexed that like there's only been really the four teams in uh florida's division plus colorado and calgary making trades like it's just a little weird that like nobody else really has gotten too deep in the I think some teams yet. are probably waiting until tomorrow to get the maximum amount of cap relief they can. Yeah. It, it's just perplexing to me cuz like you'd think that uh you know uh, that like I can understand why like Florida, Tampa, Toronto and Boston are all loading up cuz it's just going to be a death march between those four teams. But, you know, like the other divisions are all jump balls as well other than Colorado so it's like uh you know you're I would be expecting more uh to be coming out and yet not I, really. I'm not expecting so. this to be a busy deadline just because nobody's got any space I think it's gonna be I think the teams that have space have used that space and I think tomorrow honestly is gonna be a bunch of depth moves yeah and I could see that where it's like here's 40 trades and it's like, insert fourth liner for future consideration. Yeah, or, you know, someone swapping, uh, you know, maybe a team that's got to, you know, need some depth or need some AHL depth, starting to make those moves. You mentioned earlier RFAs. Like, I think it's going to be a bunch of who's he type deals. Or, oh, I didn't know he's still around type deals. Yeah. yeah. Or, like, the when the Flames got that backup goalie from Montreal, it's like... Uh, Michael McNiven. Okay. Sure. There you go. Um, yeah, I think I think it'll just be some deals like that. That's my guess for for the deadline tomorrow. But we'll see. One o'clock p.m. is the deadline. Well, plus it, 
Yeah, well, plus it's been a, a bit of a weird uh, trade deadline in that, like, frankly, there have not been too many big names on the market. Like, it, like nothing against Claude Giroux, but, like, if that's, like, your headliner of your trade deadline pool, like... And, like, then there's, like, nobody else after <laughs> Drew. It's like, um, okay. Uh, you know, like, it, it makes for a very slow uh, trade deadline show because, like, frankly, like, Calgary and Florida got the two best players between Toffoli and Drew, and, like, there's not really anything else for impact forwards left on the table. Well, and that'll be the rest of the thing to see when this all shakes out, who had the best, you know, trade deadline approach. And I think we could be looking at a week, you know, in a week when we talk next and saying, wow, even though Calgary got their business done early, they actually did the best on deadline day or leading up to deadline. Oh, uh, and frankly, I, yeah, I uh, frankly think that the flames will end up winning the trade deadline overall, just because of the fact that like they needed to, players like Toffoli and Yarncroc they went out and got two players like Toffoli and Exactly Yarncroc. like Toffoli and Yarncroc any, any, you know like there's nothing else that like was a glaring need for this team and you know like this like none of the other teams like had like that or the elite teams had as glaring of weaknesses that the Flames did and you know, the Calgary was able to go out and specifically get the things that they needed, where like a lot of other teams, not so much. So it'll be interesting well, to see. One well, way or let's the see other. what happens tomorrow, Matt. I'll talk to you next week. Yep. Yeah, and as always, go Flames, go, and boo to Toronto for reuniting Giordano and Brody. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.